Hi, I'm Dan Catanacci, a GI medical oncologist at the University of Chicago. Welcome to Practice Update. With us today, we have Lizzie Smith from Cambridge, UK. And we're going to be talking about some updates from the Checkmate 649 study that was at ASCO 2021 uh, virtual conference. And so, Lizzie, tell us, um, I guess we're going to cut to the chase what the big question is. Who should we be giving first-line therapy to with gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma? But that's the overarching question. But take us, what was the design of this study? What were the updates at ASCO 2021? And, and really is, who should we be giving this therapy to? So that's, that's a really great question, Dan. Thanks. I was great to be with you today. So Checkmate 649 was one of the biggest trials ever conducted in patients with advanced gastroesophageal and gastric cancer. It was an international uh, study uh, in which patients were randomized uh, to either standard of care chemotherapy for advanced untreated disease, which was uh, capsite with, with oxaliplatinum fluoroprimidine based, so either Bosox or Capox, uh, plus or minus nivolumab. Uh, and the primary endpoint of the trial was in patients with a PDL1 4 TPS5 or greater, although all patients, regardless of PDL1 score, were recruited to the trial. So you've got patients in the trial who have PDL1 TPS5 or greater, and you've got patients who are PDL1 less than 5 or 0, even. Uh, and so the first readout of the trial, which was practice changing, uh, was presented at ESM 2020 last year. And what we saw was that in the primary endpoint uh, group, which was CPS, PDL1, CPS5 or greater, that the addition of nivolumab to chemotherapy improved response rates, improved progression free survival, and increased overall survival uh, by about three and a half months. So this was clinically relevant, statistically significant, definitely practice changing. Then we had the old comers population. And you know, so in the old comers population, we did see an improvement in overall survival. It was somewhat less than what was seen in the uh, PDL1 CPS5 or greater group. Uh, but what we didn't see uh, at ESMO was the effect on patients who had a lower CPS score at PDL1 score. So when we take the old comers group, you know that you've got this immune sensitive group within it. And is that the group that's driving the results? So we need to understand what the results are for the patients who we know to be less immune sensitive. So those with a lower PDL1 score. And that is what was presented by uh, Professor Muller at ASCO. Uh, and so what we saw in the, in the, in the subgroup analysis was that for patients with a PDL1 score of less than five, there was not really a significant benefit uh, for the addition of nivolumab to chemotherapy. The hazard ratio was, I think, 0.94. So that doesn't really suggest any benefit for these patients. Interestingly, the response rate was improved. Um, maybe there was a, a slight increment in progression-free survival, but that didn't translate into an overall survival benefit. Uh, and, and we see that happen again and again in biomarker, in biomarker selected versus unselected groups. So for me, uh, if I was having a conversation, I mean, I think that, you know, first of all, we have to look what the approvals will be in Europe because we don't have an approval yet. So, uh, but if I was having a conversation with a patient, I think that I would be, be telling them that if they didn't have a PDL1 CPS4 of five, that the benefit would not be would it, this would it would not be a treatment that would uh, prolong uh, their survival. Unfortunately, that you might get a small increment in response rate, but you don't see the benefit in terms of overall survival. And I'm really interested to hear the conversations that you're having with your patients because you have an approval in the United States. So, um, how 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 are you having those conversations, and has that changed since we've seen these results last week? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question because you know when you have a, an FDA approval, you know I, my line lately has been just because you can doesn't mean you should, 
And, and that's, you know, keeping in mind that, as you point out, the hazard ratio is 0.94, the median survival is 12.3 to 12.4 months. There's no difference. Um, you know, you pointed out that there might be a response rate that's a little bit higher. It's single digit and non-statistically significant in like hundreds of patients. So, uh, you know, in the end, uh, it, my, my, my approach is to not give these patients this drug, but rather to, um, you know, and encourage clinical trials to see how we can get immune, their immune system revved up with novel therapies rather than just giving them something we know is not going to work. Um, and, uh, and take on the added risk of toxicity from it, which they're still at risk for. So that's been my approach. And of course, there have been conversations where patients, you know, because of the media and the, the the hype and things like that, will still will still want to do that. But you know, that's their prerogative. At least I tell them what my thoughts are, so that they're making a conscious decision and know all of the information. And when they hear me say that, then they say, "Oh, okay. Well, maybe I would rather try a trial than um, that might give me a chance, or at least full fox that will have less risk of toxicity." And the last thing I point out is that. You know, the other the other argument of do it, just doing it is that, well, what else are you going to do? Just full Fox. But I think coming up along the lines here is other options that may be better for them, like, you know, FGFR2, which is on the horizon, maybe Clodden, uh, if those studies are positive, yeah. her too. So, like, we have choices, and I think they should get what's best for them, not just blindly giving them a drug that we know may not be effective for them. Well, I, I agree with you. And it really is the concept of shared decision making in that you're giving the patient the information uh, and your, your expert opinion on that and that they will you know, help them reach a decision that's best for them on a number of different, uh, on a number of different parameters, which may be toxicity, uh, as well as, you know, to the hospital and continuation of treatment for longer. So, so I, I tend to agree with you. But in terms of the biomarker selection, for mean checkpoint blockade and gastric cancer in esophageal cancer, uh, also in famous esophageal cancer. I mean, what we've seen is that there is a, for certain patients, there is a real benefit to these drugs. And oh, that might be 30%, it might be 50%, depends on the antibody that you use, but we're not having that, we're not even, don't even have time for that conversation right. today. But, uh, but, you know, for the rest of the patients, let's explore other options. I mean, we didn't think that, you know, five six years ago, that we'd be at this point in time where we just have an abundance of immunotherapy data, an abundance of emerging data for HER2 molecules, novel, and also in combination with immune checkpoint blockade. As you see, you've got the bermatuzumab data, we've got the dobatuximab coming along. So, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased for our patients, and it's such an exciting time to be working in gastric cancer, uh, and we just need to pay attention to the trials data and have those important conversations with our patients, as you said. I agree. Um, so what about, um, based on the Checkmate 649, just to, to round this out, um, about the third arm of that study? I know we talked about it with Checkmate 648, the squamous study, which did read out. This uh, this study still has not reported that. And and um, how do we think about that arm with the nevo um, uh chemo-free approach? Well, I'm interested to see the results. We've certainly been waiting for a while on them. Uh, it's difficult to predict, uh, especially because adenocarcinoma is perhaps a little less sensitive to immune checkpoint blockade compared to squamous cancers. I think that what we can probably anticipate, even based on the you know, historical Checkmate 032 data, is that you can expect a response rate probably upwards of 25% for these patients. Uh, we might see a little bit of toxicity because we know that doublet immunotherapy tends to cause more side effects for patients than chemotherapy and immunotherapy together, for example. And potentially what we see is this crossing. There may be a long-term survival benefit, but it's the early crossing of the curve that's the worry, that there are a certain proportion of patients who live longer if they receive chemotherapy rather than combination. But, I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, so... You know, often when we try to predict the results of trials, we are incorrect. So uh, I, I guess we should just wait for that data to emerge. But, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. And again, you know, it would create some other options for patients. I'd be pleased to see it. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, thanks again, Lizzie. Checkmate 649 at ASCO 2021.